Welcome, everybody, and thanks for joining me today. Uh, I'm Robert Rodriguez, Jr., and I'm really excited to be presenting uh, what is the first in a series of free webinars uh, covering various topics in photography that I'm passionate about, that address creativity and vision. Uh, I also plan to expand beyond topics directly related to photography and uh, talk more about art and creativity in general. Once again, things that I think are fundamental to uh, any creative endeavor, uh, photography included. Uh, but today's presentation from capture to print uh, will basically lead you through the workflow that I rely on to make an image from completion, from conception to the final print. And uh, hopefully I can share uh, sort of my approach and the thinking process that I use, of course, uh, software and techniques and, and camera settings and, th and things like that. But really what's most important for me to share, um, again, is the mindset, the attitude that I think really is what um, can make, can take you from doing mediocre work to good or great work. All right. So with that said, let's get started. Um, feel free to post any questions uh, via that chat window uh, on the right that's next to your um, next to the video. I will try to answer as many questions as I can uh, later on in the at the end of the webinar. Whatever I don't get around to, um, I plan on doing actually a Q&A webinar in a couple of weeks, and I'll be addressing more of those questions there. So, uh, you know, the questions are, are important to me, and I definitely want to try to respond to as many of you as I can. Um, there will be a replay of the webinar available in a couple of weeks to subscribers. That will include the Q&A section. Um, at some point, I'll put the video on YouTube for anyone to watch, but that won't include uh, the, the, uh, the Q&A. And so if you want that interaction and feedback and, and, uh, and, and be able to ask questions, uh, you definitely want to watch the webinars. Uh, and finally, I want to just talk a little bit about my philosophy, my approach to landscape photography. Number one, those of you who know me know that I'm not about uh, prescriptions or formulas or trying to give you uh, a list of things that you need to do when, uh, when, as a photographer. Of course, those things are important when you're learning, when you're learning the principles, but um, I'm much more, again, about the creative approach. And so this is just one way of approaching landscape photography, a way that is based uh, on almost 12 years of experience uh, of, of, of working and failing very often in the field and making mistakes. And uh, that's another thing that I want to mention, which is this idea of success and failure. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, the opposite of success is not failure. The opposite of success is doing nothing. It's apathy. It's idleness. It, 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 it's not trying. Uh, when you uh, make an image, when you do something creative and it works, then you move forward. You learn more. You take one step forward along this, this path. When you fail, assuming that you're motivated to learn, assuming that your goal, that your aspiration is to get better, when you fail, you figure out what went wrong, you correct it, and you move forward again. And again, that's pointing you towards success. That's pointing you towards getting better. So failure is inherently a part of any creative act. And that's how I like to approach it. I'm not so much interested in what I'm achieving in terms of results. I'm interested in my process because the process is what I know is going to get me to improve. A good process, uh, which involves good habits, um, a, a, a positive attitude, and trying to learn from my mistakes is going to propel you much further along this creative path than simply following uh, rules. All right. This is what I want to try to share in today's webinar. I'm going to try to cover two images. I'm going to talk about environmental factors uh, like light, and what I'm thinking about in the field, how I, how I approach a particular location, uh, compositional ideas in, in respect to these two images, how I approach trying to make a composition based on what I saw and how I interacted with the environment and with the visual, uh, the visual stimuli, as it were. Uh, camera settings, of course, what cameras I used, the settings that I used, and why I chose those settings. I'm going to try to cover as much of that as I can. Uh, my overall workflow in the field, how I am um, kind of get going into the field and getting set up and making images. 
Of course, the developing in Lightroom, which is a key component of shooting in RAW, because as we know, RAW is really just the, the, the raw information that your camera sensor captures and how we interpret that is what's going to give it its look, its visual look, and also it's going to allow us to put some of our own perception, some of our own uh, responses to the scene into the image itself, which is, again, vitally important for uh, conveying some motion in an image. Deciding when you're finished, right, when you're editing in Lightroom, how do you know when you're done? How do you know when, when, when enough is enough or when you still may need to do some more or can do some more? And finally, uh, for me, any image that I think is, is, um, is a part of my portfolio personally is an image that I want to print. For me, I'm not finished until I have a print in hand. So I'm going to talk about the prints, how I chose the paper and show you the, the, uh, the prints that resulted from uh, these two images. Now, the, the key to managing this entire process from beginning to end can be broken down into kind of three basic guiding principles that I use. Uh, number one, clarity about why I'm making a photograph. Uh, I want to be sure that when I press the shutter button, I'm pressing it for a good reason. And, and for me, generally, that means that I'm responding to something. I see something that is interesting, something that moves me, something that sparks some sort of excitement in me. If I don't have any of that, if I don't feel anything at all, and I'm basically just going through the motions of taking pictures, more, than, more likely than not, I'm not going to come away with anything that is going to give me that same sense afterwards. I think you respond to an image after you've made it because you felt something at the time you made it. And I think that's, uh, again, very important. The discipline to separate the image making from judgment. Uh, when I teach workshops, I constantly see students looking at the camera's LCD every time they make an image, chimping, we like to call it. And I understand why people do that. Uh, I've, do, I've done it myself many times. But the inherent problem with that, the potential problem, is that you're uh, putting together the idea of making something, of being creative, and also judging yourself. And I think those two things really are separate and distinct. When we're creating, we need to be free without judgment to try new things, to experiment, to feel confident about what we're doing. And, and it's very hard to jump back and forth between judging what I'm doing and also trying to make pictures. Not to mention the fact that in the landscape, when we're working with light and nature, there almost isn't any time, whether that's actual physical time in space or time in my mind to be able to manage all these different things. So I want to stay in the creative mindset, in the right side of the brain, if you will, as much as possible when I'm in the field. Don't really care so much about what happens after I press the button. I'm only interested in the next press of the shutter button. And then later, I can make judgments about what I did. And finally, knowing the tools intuitively and maximizing their strengths. You want to know your camera and your gear inside out so that you know exactly what it can do when you want to do it. Because if not, then again, you're jumping between two different things. Seeing something, wanting to capture or create some sort of perception of what you're seeing, and then struggling with using the tools. And we see in the best musicians, the best artists, that they use their tools like an extension of their hand, of their mind. They instantly know what to grab or what to use when they want to convey a sense of, uh, of, of whatever they're feeling. So in a sense, creative limitations are kind of important. The more you limit yourself, whether that's subject matter, camera gear, or how you're working in the field, the more, to be honest, leads to the, the more that leads to spontaneity, not less. Uh, it leads to more spontaneity, more discovery, to more surprises. You're not struggling with mechanics. You're letting your vision and your heart guide you in a focused way. Uh, creative flow, which is another one of those things that I that I am passionate about, is you know that that's that's when you're so consumed by something, by an activity, that you don't even notice anything outside of that. You're in the zone, so to speak, and that's going to be your best chance to make images that are uh, unique and personal. Thinking is more interesting than knowing, but less interesting than looking. That's by the great philosopher Goethe. And I love this quote because um, thinking is okay. Thinking is better than knowing because now you're using what you know in new and exciting ways. But of course, looking, that's what I'm most interested in, is not in camera specs or gear or 
particular formulas. I want to use my eyes to respond to what I'm seeing. That's what's going to drive me uh, to, uh, I think, be as creative as possible. So let's jump to uh, first image. This is uh, southern Utah, about uh, 15 miles south of Moab, along the Colorado River. And this is an area that uh, I have visited many, many times uh, and explored various parts of it. And um, I didn't make the image that I'm going to show you on this particular day. This is a day that I was scouting. Lots of times people ask me about scouting and, and how do you find new places to go. And one of them is just kind of exploring, finding, uh, buying hiking uh, books that show you where the hiking trails are and then going out and venturing in these places and just sort of seeing how you respond. I, sometimes I go hiking without even my camera just to get a sense of what everything feels like. And I'll use my iPhone or things or, or small camera just to kind of make visual snapshots of what I see. But I, I this rock in particular, the, these three large rocks in front of me uh, were very attractive for some reason or another. They had a certain shape that stood out from everything else. And I was drawn to them. I, I saw them and I, they pulled me in like a magnet. And that's the kind of thing that I think you want to respond to in the, in the, uh, in the landscape. So I returned uh, on a second, uh, second or third day early in the morning. And there was much better light, as you can see. This is kind of my first approach. It's before sunrise, the sun hasn't quite come up, yet, come up yet, and I'm sort of getting my bearings. Not physically, but getting my visual bearings in place. How, how, do, what do, how do I want to place this rock? Uh, what do I want in the background? What's my composition going to look like? And I'm starting to experiment. And this is kind of my first image. It's okay, but as I said, I make an image and then I wait and see what happens next. That's part of this workflow. It's not like look at make the image and then start analyzing to see if it works. No, I make an image and then I say, okay, what's happening now? What's going on around me? Um, a little while later, the sun comes up. And of course, everything changes when the sun comes up. The color of the light changes. The color of everything around me changes. Now I have highlights and shadows. I have things that draw my eye in. And as soon as I saw the light hitting the top of those cliffs, in the distance, I changed my perspective and I was trying to incorporate that light in a way that was interesting. You see, I have some light in the upper right and the upper left hitting those cliffs. But this image quite doesn't work so well uh, because I've got some trees. Let me switch over to <clears throat> my highlighter here. Um, I got these trees here that are problematic and I'm not quite sure what to do with them. They stand out in visual in, in visual design. If you have one or two of something, they sort of create a second subject, if you will. They're not a pattern like the bushes are, these bushes here, but they're, they're sort of standing on their own and they interfere. They are in the way. They I can't quite manage them uh, or consolidate them with the rocks. And so I realized that I need to take a different approach and I turn around completely 180 degrees and I'm facing the other direction now and this now feels a lot nicer. Uh, it feels nicer to me intuitively in terms of where everything is placed. The light is much more even across the top uh, <clears throat> and, I, and I sort of like the way, again, the, the, the light is hitting these rocks. Now, in terms of working with light, notice that I turned 180. Why did I turn 180? Because in both instances, I'm trying to capture or I'm trying to get the, the best side light to give some highlights and shadows to the rock. And so when you look at the rock here, there's light on this side hitting this and the shadow on the backside over here. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking to create these shadows. That's what gives any object in space form. It's where the light uh, hits it from the side. If you front light something, which means the light is hitting you in the back of the head, and so the object itself, the shadow is being cast behind it, you don't see the shadow, you don't see form, it looks very flat. And photography is one of those mediums where we need to recreate the, uh, the, the illusion of three dimensions on, in a two-dimensional medium. And so you always want to have light that's from the side or even backlit. What You want to see the shadows. So I'm okay with this image, except that I still don't feel like I'm, uh, the composition is quite right. I've placed the rocks right in the center. I've got um, these rocks down here that are sort of uh, this area here that really isn't quite working for me. Um, it's a distraction. Do I need those rocks there? Not really. And also the, the main rock here in the center, 
doesn't quite feel um, doesn't quite feel balanced with the rest of the scene. So I move a little bit closer and more to the right to get even closer to that to this foreground element here. And I like this better, except to me now, I feel like I've gotten a little bit too tight. I'm a little bit too close to my subject matter. And there was a nice rhythm of these of these rocks, these circular lines that were sort of leading down into the uh, into the uh, bottom left hand corner of the frame that I've lost. I've kind of lost that. And so I back up a little bit more and make another image. By the way, I will share my camera settings in a moment, but I did say I'm backing up. I'm not zooming, I'm backing up. That's two different things. If I zoom, I change my perspective. I change uh, sort of the, the relationship between the foreground and the background. So I'm basically kind of staying at a, at a, at a single uh, focal length, which is around, I want to say 20 millimeters, and I'm backing up. I'm moving my tripod backwards. And finally here, I think I've got the image that feels best to me. And the reasons for that are um, these are these circular patterns, these circular shapes that I was talking about before. All right, now you can really see how they create a nice, a nice rhythm, a nice repetition. That's number one. Number two, I've got some more space in this area here between the foreground and the background. Um, I still can really see these shapes here, which I find really interesting and organic and beautiful. And I've also placed these grasses here in more, more uh, along a third, and while I don't really use the rule of thirds as a as a as a as a formula, I see it. I see it when I look through the frame, and if I see something that feels better, it usually means that it's lying along a third, and I don't have to fight that rule. I don't have to fight that tendency. The rule of thirds exists because it works for a good reason. Um, and I also like that there's a nice relationship between the entire foreground here and the background. The rocks and these foreground elements are very strong. I have the texture of them right in the frame. I, I feel like I'm capturing the thing that attracted me to the scene, but the light in the background is also creating a sense of place, a sense of context, and it's showing you um, that I'm within this landscape that is capturing or that is catching this beautiful light in the morning, and I'm trying to show a sense of place, a sense of timelessness, if you will. And that's sort of what the whole image is about. So this image I made with uh, my Canon 5DSR um, settings, one tenth of a second at f16, uh, ISO 100. Now, because I'm on a tripod and I use uh, FLM tripods, uh, I'm usually using the lowest ISO setting possible. I don't need to worry about anything moving. There was no wind or anything like that. The grasses aren't moving. And so low, low ISO means that uh, I have least amount of noise. And shutter speed is not an issue. So my shutter speed is about a tenth of a second. Uh, F16, why F16? I want plenty depth. I want plenty of depth of field, and I'm using hyperfocal distance to figure out more or less how close I can get. And I will talk about hyperfocal distance in a moment. Uh, and it's this is 22 millimeters, no filters, and as I said, uh, this is 628. So it's about um, uh, 18 minutes after sunrise. All right, and so and so again, this is this is my final capture. Now, it doesn't mean that I didn't make more images after this. I probably moved on and made some other images. But as the light continue, as the sun continued to rise, that that line along those cliffs in the background continued to drop and get higher and higher and lower and lower, and that sort of changed the whole the whole sort of feel of the of the image. And so I felt like this was the most opportune time uh, to make that image. Now. Let me talk about hyperfocal distance for a moment, uh, because a lot of people get confused about this. My my focus point in this image is probably somewhere uh, a little bit beyond this rock here, uh, and that's because my hyperfocal distance was about four feet, meaning that everything from half that distance to infinity will be sharp. Hyperfocal distance. Uh, basically is a way for you to calculate where you need to focus so that everything from half that distance to infinity is sharp. And infinity, I'm talking about probably way back here. From here to about here is about half the distance. And this area here is probably around two feet away from my lens. And so my hyperfocal uh, point, the point where I focus is over here. Now, here's another way of, of explaining hyperfocal distance. Um, We've got on the left-hand side, that shows you what I just explained, which is that uh, 
if this is your hyperfocal distance here, this is where you focus, and that will give you everything from half that distance to infinity uh, sharp. Now, how do you calculate or how do you know what the hyperfocal distance is? Well, you can memorize them. Uh, base, it's based on your camera sensor, camera sensor size, and it's based on your, uh, your focal length and your aperture. Okay, there are calculators that you can use. One of them that I really like is called Depth of Field Calculator. It's at uh, dofmaster.com. And you can see here on the right, I've put in my, my camera. Uh, focal length is 22, and uh, f-stop is f-16, and my subject distance is 3.5, roughly 3.5 to 4 feet. And you can see on the right-hand side, it tells me what my near limit is, okay, which is 1.7 or roughly 2 feet. Uh, and my hyperfocal distance is four feet. So I focus at four feet. It gives me everything from two feet to infinity uh, to be generally sharp, okay? And I don't obsess over this. I don't break out a ruler and measure things in the field. I want things to generally be sharp, okay? Notice that over here, okay, as soon as you get closer than half the hyperfocal distance, things don't completely go soft. They gradually go softer. And again, as long as I get the, the, my foreground or the main element of my foreground sharp, then even if things are slightly softer coming uh, towards me, that's okay. The eye is going to be pushed towards things that are sharper. And looking at the image, the 90% the of that big object, that rock that was in the foreground, um, is sharp. Another way you can get hyperfocal distance is uh, using an app. There are many apps available. One of my favorites is one by a company called PhotoPills or an app called PhotoPills uh, for the iPhone. I'm not sure if they have <clears throat> a version for, uh, for uh, Android phones. But you can see here the same thing. I've punched in uh, my camera, my focal length, and it based on my the aperture that I choose, uh, you can see it tells me what my subject distance is going to be, four feet. I focus there. Half that distance is about roughly half, so it's one foot ten inches or uh, two feet uh, to infinity. Okay, so this is another app that you can use, and I've, I use this app on occasion. I used to actually print a little chart uh, at the focal lengths that I used most often, and I just use it when I was out in the field, and then slowly I memorized them for some of the most common focal lengths. I generally don't go any smaller than f16 because of diffraction, and so at f16, I kind of know what the uh, hyperfocal distance is at, let's say, 18, 19, 20, 22 millimeters, that kind of thing. All right, so it's just a question of practicing this, but I would practice this all the time, like just in my backyard with any subject, just to see hyperfocal distance, how it works, how it functions. And you want to make that natural so that when you're in the field, you're not having to uh, spend too much time working with that. You can focus on what's going on uh, in front of you. All right, so let's jump into uh, Lightroom and I'll show you what I have there. All right, so here's the image uh, in Lightroom, the finished image, as you can see here. Uh, I'm going to hit D for develop, and I have a couple of uh, snapshots saved here. So this is the final, and this is my import. So this is what the image looked like when I imported it into Lightroom. All right, so let me show you again the final, and that's the import. All right, and I think if I hit Y here, that'll show you before. No, this is before and after. Okay, so I have to make some adjustments first. So let me show you what I did to the image. Now, remember I said at the beginning that when I develop images in Lightroom, I try to make it a creative process, something that I, I'm going to have fun doing, that I'm going to enjoy. And the way I do that really is to think about why I made the image, what I was looking for compositionally, what I thought was interesting, and then carry those ideas into Lightroom so that I'm just not experimenting with the sliders. I have sort of a plan, if you will. I have sort of a, of a workflow in terms of, okay, I know, I know what, I, what the image needs to look like to bring back the memories and the inspiration that made me capture that image. I don't see it here because obviously it's a, it's a flat raw file, and so it needs to have more of the perception of what I saw in the image itself. Plus the fact that color, for instance, is very much a, uh, a subjective thing. And so that's something that I have to put into the image myself. And it's going to be different for everyone. It's going to be different for you, just like it is for me. So I'm going to hit D 
First thing I'm gonna do here is, uh, I'm not gonna go through too much of what the controls in Lightroom do, otherwise we'll be here <laughs> all night, uh, all the afternoon, all night, but I will talk about why I'm using the controls uh, as I use them. So typically I start with exposure, uh, and in general, this exposure was pretty good. Uh, exposure is your overall brightness, overall brightness or darkness, or you know your midpoint, your uh, midtones. What are the midtones looking like? And I felt like they needed to be a little brighter. I was probably protecting myself against blowing these highlights in the back, so I underexposed slightly. So I'm going to bring this up to about there. Okay, midtones are looking uh, better now. I'm going to adjust my white point. First, I'm going to hold on the Option key, and if I hold on Option and click on Whites, I get this black overlay, and I can push this until I start to clip the whites. Right there, I'm going to back off a bit around here. Okay, adjust my blacks. Hold on Option again, and as I drag the black slider down, okay, so that's telling me that those areas are clipping, and I'm going to back off from there a little bit. And I also need to see what is clipping. So I don't always keep this option button pressed. I want to let it go and see what's clipping so that I can decide if that's something that I need to preserve or not. I need to preserve the details in this area. And I can see that for the most part, that's just a shadow. I don't need to show any tones in there. So I'm okay with clipping that uh, just a bit. I'm going to pull down my highlights to bring back some of the sky. About there for now. I'm going to increase my shadows. And again, these are not formulas. They're just basically getting myself into the ballpark. That's what I use the basic panel for. Just to get a sense of what the image should look like. And then I start to work on more specific areas. I'm going to increase clarity. Uh, let's say about uh, 20. 20 or so. Let's add some vibrance. Bring some of that color back. Okay, so already just with those few moves there, uh, I'm liking the image a lot more. Again, this is all a personal choice, of course. I have a particular look that I like for my images, a particular style. I like my images to look um, organic, but I also like them to look real. I also want to put my interpretation of the scene into the picture. I want, I don't feel like I have to be true to what my eyes actually saw. I want to be true to what I felt and what I was responding to. Sometimes those things, uh, you know, are similar or the same, and sometimes they're not. Uh, but I want it to feel as though this is a place that is real to me, not something that I've sort of recreated out of my imagination. It's got to be based on some reality because the reality of being in the landscape is is why I do this. It's it's about being in this place and what it makes me feel like. Okay. Okay. So. Um, I haven't added any contrast here yet, um, and I, depending on some, depending on the image, sometimes I'll add some contrast here. Sometimes I'll use the tone curve. I think that I can bring more uh, to have more control. And so in this case, I think I use the tone curve, and I'm going to select the medium contrast curve just as a starting point. And this puts a bunch of points on this curve here that I can then adjust individually. And sometimes just using the medium contrast. Uh, gives me what I want and already I can see this is looking a lot better. Let me show you the before or where I started Okay, and that's after So I'm really close to what this what I want this image to look like um, Sometimes I have to do a lot and sometimes I don't have to do a lot and you know, Neither is right or wrong. I, um, I think it's uh, probably not the best way to approach editing an image is not to say I have to do lots and lots and lots of things to it. Sometimes the light and the situation and the atmosphere and the way you captured it, it just everything was captured, you know, just right. You don't need to do a lot to it. There's, a, there's contrast already in the image. Sometimes you need to do more work, but don't feel like you have to always go through this checklist of processes or adjustments to make an image work. Sometimes um, very simple adjustments can make an image work. Now, just to... Uh, just to uh, highlight this, I do have lens correction. Uh, oh, let me turn that on. That was off. So let me turn that on. Lens correction is on now. Um, you should always have this turned on for any image. I forget because I always also use mirrorless cameras and uh, they don't need lens correction turned on, but on this Canon I do. So there we go. Lens correction uh, basically helps to fix distortion in your lenses. It also helps to correct for light that's falling off into the edges. 
Okay, so I'm pretty good now with the image. I want to make some local adjustments now. This is, I think, where um, the the creative aspects of editing uh, of Lightroom, of editing RAW files, of any photograph really, uh, can really make make your images that much more dimensional. So first, I want to work a little more in the sky. So I'm going to drop a graduated filter here. Just about like that. And I'm going to pull down on the highlights once again on the graduate filter. Oops, not clarity, highlights. There we go. Because I know I had clouds in the sky and I want those clouds, those beautiful wispy clouds to break the blues that are in the sky just to give me some more texture up there. And to emphasize that texture, I'm going to add some clarity also to this filter. And that just helps those clouds just give them a little more uh, depth and dimension. Okay, now once I do that, I will often go back to the basic panel and make some more adjustments. So for example, let me check my white point again. And you can see here now that I have, uh, well, no, it's still good. Not clipping anything there. Let me check my blacks again. I'm gonna come down a little bit lower this time on the blacks down to about 30. Okay, and again, I'm checking to see what I'm clipping, and if it's if it's nothing that I need to preserve shadow detail, then I'll keep going. So it's always important to uh, adjust your whites and your blacks as you look at the image. In other words, come out of that preview mode so that you can see exactly what it's doing, visually looking and checking. Use your eyes all the time, never mind what the numbers say. Okay, so then that's before, and that's after. Now I want to, I'm generally happy i'm generally happy with the background but i think the foreground the rock itself can just have a lot more dimension to it because those are the things that i was responding to i was just fascinated with the formation of the rock with its shape with its structure uh as you can tell i, I really like rocks so let me click on the brush tool here and i'm going to create a, a lighten brush or a dodging brush that's basically a preset that sets the exposure to a quarter of a stop and I'm gonna hit this rock in a few spots. So I'm gonna brighten this here a little bit like so, make sure that my flow and feather is good, okay. Maybe along this area here. I'm adjusting the size of the brush with the left and right bracket keys. Um, let's brighten this up there. This just gives it some more depth. I'm looking where the light is falling. I'm looking at the areas that are brighter and darker and just accentuating them just a bit. Okay, this is not adding anything to the, to what's not there already. This area here is a little brighter, so I'm just gonna make that even more uh, accentuated. This area here, which is catching that beautiful light right next to the shadow, I'm going to just add a little bit there, maybe a little bit here, and then I wanna increase these little ridges here, like that. Increase the a sense of movement and depth and dimension in this area here. Uh, these grasses here, I'm going to make a little brighter. There we go, to get some of those uh, greens in there. Maybe this little spot here, this little rock here that I like the way the light kind of catches that area as well. Okay, just added this little grass area here. I'll leave these rocks dark because I want this area to be, to stand uh, to stand out. A uh, part of all this is creating depth in the image. How do we separate things so that they look, don't look like they're on top of each other? Creating your foreground, middle ground, background. That's not a formula. That's just a way of creating a sense of immersion so that when your viewers look at your images, they feel as though they're there with you. And if they do that, then you, you're, you're a big part of the way towards helping them to see what it is that you felt or feel uh, what you felt. This tree here, I'm going to just lighten a little bit. That separates from the background a bit. Same thing with this rock here. This kind of a nice stepping stone between this rock. It's also the similar color, all right? And I think I'm pretty much done there. So here's the before and there's the after. I'm gonna hit the Y key to show you the two uh, images before and after. And that's pretty much it. I mean, I really didn't do much else to this image to give me uh, what I was looking for. Of course, the print is a thing that I um, am always going to do to make sure that uh, it looks the way I want it to look on a piece of paper. So 
let's jump into the print module and I'll show you what that looks like. I printed this image. Well, here's the layout in the print module. I printed this on a uh, A3 plus sheet of paper, uh, 13 by 19. Uh, I'll talk about the paper that I used in a moment. Um, I like to use, I like to put my logo here as an identity plate. And uh, I'm also printing this image at uh, 600 uh, PPI because I'm printing it to my Canon printer. And I like to use, or I follow the approach of using the printer's native uh, resolution, the printhead's native resolution. Uh, and because this image is pretty high res, 50 plus megapixels, I can print it at 600 uh, PPI with great results. All right, so that's what it looks like in Lightroom. Now let's look at the print itself. So for this print, I, I selected uh, Canson Infinity print making, print making rag uh, 310 GSM paper. Uh, as I said, it's 13 by 19, A3 plus size. Um, I printed it on my Canon IPF 8400. That's a 44 inch wide roll printer. And as I said before, I printed it at 600 uh, PPI. And this is the actual print. This is a photograph of the print with the best possible lighting that I could so that the print looks, uh, you know, as, as, as realistic as possible. This is no substitution for holding the print in your hand, of course, but this is the best we can do given uh, the webinar. And um, I chose this paper because printmaking rag is a matte paper with a very slight surface texture. Uh, and I thought that A, the, the, the fact that it's a matte paper would, will really help to emphasize the organic nature of the image. I have strong light, but I don't want the light to be overly strong. To my eye, to, my, to, to the way it felt to me that morning, it was a beautiful golden light. It wasn't this harsh overriding light. It wasn't a light that was blinding me. It was a light that was just uh, sort of giving me a sense of crescendo from the foreground up to the background. And so the paper, I think, really helps to give that same sense of, of uniformity, of tranquility, but at the same time, uh, the, the, the subtle texture of the paper interacts with, with everything in the print, including uh, that foreground rock. And uh, printmaking rag is just a beautiful paper for that. It's great to hold. It feels substantial, and the feel of it is really nice. Here's a close-up. Uh, of that of the area with the rocks and you can see barely see how the paper's texture itself uh, sort of mingles and complements the texture of the rock there in a beautiful way and I just like that that uh, that interaction I don't choose a paper because I like the paper I choose a paper based on the image that I'm going to print and how I think the paper best can complement the image and my vision for the image and you can see here that even on a matte paper I lose no uh, uh, detail in terms of these little fine grasses, but yet they still have a nice organic quality to them. All right, and finally, that's um, that's the uh, the print from a low angle there, so you can see, you can get a sense of the the paper itself. All right, so. Let's look at the second image for this evening. Uh, here we are at a totally different part of the country. We are now in, uh, in Maine, in the mid coast of Maine at Acadia National Park, a place called Eagle Lake. And once again, this is a place that I have visited many, many times. Uh, I'm very familiar with it, I think, and I've written many times on my blog about familiarity, and um, and revisiting a place over and over again just to get a sense of the possibilities to get a to get a feel for what a place uh, really what a place does to you how you feel that how you react to it and the way I feel here is is quite different from the way I feel in the Southwest although I would venture to guess probably that fundamentally it's the same it's this idea it's this feel that nature is something that uh, is healthier than anything else I've ever experienced, but in different ways. Um, on this particular morning, it was windy, again cloudy. Uh, I, I was thinking of something that had a softer feel, calm waters, but um, it, you know, it wasn't going to have it this day. So here's the same day, the sun comes up. I like the light, I like the shadows. I'm particularly interested in the light that you see on the left-hand side 
um, behind that tall pine tree, the way it kind of throws this little beam of light across the mountain there. You'll see in a moment uh, that clearer. But uh, on this particular day, it wasn't happening. And so I kind of made, made a note of this, made a note of the, the, the place and the angle. Uh, and then I returned. And on a, on a different day, this possibly might have been uh, a few days later, I had much better conditions. You can see here the water is calm. There's no wind. I got a much better sky. And so this is kind of my first approach. I'm trying to get a sense of the feel of the water, the glass-like water receding into the distance up to those mountains in the back. Um, it's okay, but, you know, it, I, don't, I don't quite know that I've got what I want there. And it's not because I'm just looking at the OCD, I'm just basically looking at it. I'm standing on these rocks and looking and saying, yeah, that's an interesting idea, but not quite there yet. Uh, a little while later, the sun comes up. It's, again, same as the previous image. Light is, for me, the thing that sort of drives everything. It's the fuel, the energy behind where I'm going to look, what I'm going to look for in a composition. It's basically going to guide me in terms of everything I do compositionally, which is why I say photograph light first. Of course, we photograph subjects and objects and shapes and masses and lines and so forth. But the light is the thing that gives everything uniformity or can give it uniformity. At the same time, it can also <laughs> um, uh, give you lots of chaos as well if you don't control your perspective, your view, and, and how you're framing a scene. So this is the second image I made uh, or a, a subsequent image that I made. And again, not quite sure it is what I want. Um, a little while later, though, I do find, I start to find out what it is that I'm looking for, the simplicity of the water with just a few little grasses there. And you can see that light that I mentioned before just starting to um, throw that little band of uh, light across the top of that mountain, just showing you in a subtle, nuanced way the colors that are on the top of that mountain because it's a late fall and so we're getting um, a lot of color change. <clears throat> um, this image is okay, but not quite there yet. So I make another and I'm trying to simplify. I'm trying to manage everything that's in the foreground here. So going back to the previous one, um, I like it, you know, but I, I think that this area here, kind of problematic. I'm not quite sure that I like that. I find it too busy, too many repeating elements here. Uh, and the grasses kind of feel a little dispersed to me here. And so I'm not quite sure that I like all of that. I, I feel as though it's not clear enough, not simple enough, as I say in my workshops all the time. If something isn't adding, then you have to take it away. For instance, these little grasses here aren't really adding anything to the image. I've got the basic elements here, this rhythmic pattern that I'm really, really attracted to. This rhythm here, that's what I want. A little bit more here, and then all this here is just chaos. It's just interfering with that. So I make another, I'm getting a little closer, a little tighter, trying to simplify some more. It's okay, not quite there yet. I make a subsequent image. I back up a little bit, probably because in this previous one, you can see at the bottom there, I felt as though maybe I was compromising that too much. And uh, I wanted to sort of create a simple uh, frame around of blue, a simple frame of blue around all these different objects. And that's the sort of the, the final capture. I think I made one more. Yes. And so I make one more. And this is the one that I decide to keep. I've got just enough elements in the foreground there to give it rhythm, to give it a sense of structure. There are also some extra elements there that are sort of random uh, on the bottom there that are in different places. But the most important thing here is maintaining this relationship between the foreground here, okay, then connecting the foreground to the background. The viewer's eye is going to see this because that is where the light is, just as before. I'm responding to the light and to the reflection in the shadow in the uh, in the water here, and this is the thing that connects the two. This gives me, this gives me some weight in terms of the tonal, uh, the tonal value of those shapes there are, are dark and heavy, and so they give me some weight to ground the image. They also look as though they're floating in a sense. You can almost see those rocks that's floating in the water. And I kind of like that because there's a sense there of abstractness, of inviting you to look at the image over and over again. It's this, it's this idea that there is more to see every time you look at the image. Okay, And I'm very careful, very, very careful not to um, 
cut that off there because that shape I feel needs to be right on the edge. It's that little bit of tension that I think balances these shapes over here. And then they start to repeat and get larger and larger until eventually you get to the one big shape on top. Another thing is that notice that I am being very careful about the edges, as I mentioned before, not only here, but also at the top. I'm trying to maximize all the corners of the frame so that I really create as much tension as possible. And while I did cut this off here, okay, I've really established this line here with uh, these rocks there. And then once again, the, 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 the mass of the mountain here on top is really what's going to ground the image from top to bottom. Usually we ground from bottom to top, but in this case, it's the opposite way. That's just the way I saw it, the way I felt it. So let's look at some settings here. I made this image with my Olympus uh, EM1, one, uh, one, 250th of a second at f11. Uh, f11 because I'm at 48 millimeters. That's in, uh, in the uh, micro four thirds sensor, but in terms of uh, compa uh, comparable to 35 millimeter, that's 96 millimeters on a 35 millimeter camera. So I'm fairly tight, I'm fairly zoomed in and I need to have as much depth of field as possible. So I'm stopping down my, my aperture, you know, f not tremendously small, but fairly small to get that depth of field. I'm interested, I wanna make sure that the grasses are nice and, sh nice and sharp and also that the mountain in the back with the trees is relatively sharp. I don't want that to go soft on me because then I think you lose the textural element of it. Plus, that's probably where your, your, your eyes are going to go immediately after the foreground to where the light, the warm light, um, is in the image. All right, so that's, um, as I said, 48 millimeters at f11. ISO 200, the Olympus doesn't go, anywhere, any, uh, doesn't go below ISO 200. That's the minimum. I'm on a tripod again, my FLM, and this is at uh, 717, which is um, you know a good 32 minutes after sunrise. So I waited around for this. I kind of waited for the light to 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 get high enough and give me more uh, things to to photograph, but not so high that I'd lose the subtle shadow on the top of that mountain. That dark mass with just a little bit of light opening up the color there, I think, is what I was most drawn to and most attracted to. All right, so let's jump into Lightroom now. So here's the uh, finished image and I will hit D for develop. And here is the, oops, sorry. I made a mistake there. I meant to click on import. All right, so that's the imported version, the original version, and once again, the final version. So I'm gonna hit D for develop. So same approach. I generally start with the uh, basic panel and move on from there. And also I'm looking at the image and I'm trying to decide what is it that I need to do to this image how can I interpret this image to bring it back to what I responded to, what I reacted to? Now, the image that I showed you a moment ago in, uh, before, that one is already processed. So um, I'm giving you the advantage of seeing what I did after the fact. But initially, when I start to develop an image, I don't have the luxury of seeing a processed version. I'm starting with the original, which is why it's so important for me. And, I tell, uh, and I'm telling you as well, it's so important to keep a sense in your mind of you know, what it is that you're reacting to, responding to, what's driving your composition. Sometimes I have a little notebook and I'll jot down things about uh, what I saw, what I felt, etc. That helps me after the fact. I have found over many years that uh, interpreting an image, developing an image, post-processing, if you want to call it that, an image, that way it's much more intuitive and fun than sort of guessing and seeing where an image goes. Not that I'm against uh, exploring or experimenting. But uh, once again, it's it's more a question of limitations, limiting yourself in, in a certain respect so that then you have more uh, freedom to be creative and to be spontaneous because you have a framework to work around. Okay, so exposure once again, and probably uh, this is somewhat underexposed. I probably could have exposed uh, could have uh, exposed this a little bit better. 
I was probably working under tight time constraints. The light was raising, was rising quickly, and uh, I was just trying to make sure that I got the composition just right. So exposure could be a little brighter. Again, I'm looking at the midtones. That's kind of what guides my decisions about exposure, and that's what the exposure slider does anyhow. It basically adjusts the midtones of the image, the midtones of the data that the raw file has captured. Let's adjust my white point here. And I can come up to about there. That's blowing out the sky. So I'm going to back off there. Let's adjust the blacks. I'm going to hold on Option. So I'm clipping that area there. I'm going to let go of the Option key to see what that is. And I don't want to lose all of the shadow detail in this rock because there is some interesting subtle, subtle shadows there that I know I can preserve and that I know that I can show in a print. So that's as far as I'm going to go right there. Okay, zoom back out. Okay, about there. Uh, I'm going to pull down highlights a bit, just a bit. I know that I'm probably going to have to use, or I am going to use, a separate adjustment brush to uh, control the sky, but I'm just putting on that highlights just to see if it gives me a little more textural dimension here where these highlights are in the reflection of the sky and the water, and it does. I'm going to open up the shadows, maybe about there. When I add, uh, when I open the shadows or add uh, light into the shadows, using the shadow slider, I typically will go back to the blacks. In fact, I'm always readjusting these controls. None of these controls should be a set and forget. You should go back and readjust them every time you make other adjustments because they're always going to change in relation to the other things that you do uh, to the image. So let me go back and look at the blacks again. And I can pull those down a little bit more now because I added some more shadows. I'm going to add some contrast here just in general uh, about there. So that's where we are now. That's before and that's after. So it's looking better. I, I really don't, I'm not interested in, I really want the sky to be sort of negative space, not white negative space. I don't want it to be bland, but I want it to have some tone, but I don't want the sky to compete at all with the foreground. To me, the most interesting part of the image, the way your eye flows top to bottom, has to do with the gradation of color, with the fact that from the top it's warmer and the bottom is cooler. If I make the sky too dark or too blue, now I'm going to throw that sort of movement out of balance. I'm basically going to say the bottom and the top are equally important for the same reason, and that's not what I want. I want the bottom and the top to be important for different reasons, for, for different things. I want the bottom to be somewhat cooler as I experienced it, and then as I move to the top, the mountain and the light was warmer. And so the key here is to make sure that I uh, can maintain that, but at the same time, don't let the sky become too bland or too or too uninteresting. But, um, but that's why I'm not so interested in um, pulling back the sky tremendously. Plus, it was, re it was really bright. I mean, the sun is rising uh, from the east, which is on the left to the left of the image, and it's really throwing a lot of light behind the mountain and casting the shadow along the top of the mountain there. So... So let's continue. So at this point, um, we finished with here. Let me add some clarity. Some vibrance. And again, vibrance is a really nice control in Lightroom because it uh, adds color in a very organic way. It adds color to areas that are less saturated to begin with. Saturation tends to be very uh, coarse. Sometimes I will use it. I probably will use it in this image just a little bit to give me some more uh, color. So I'm just going to add a little bit of saturation here, like so. But vibrance is really the main adjustment that I'm using to add color uh, to the image in a way that's more natural to me, more, orga more organic. Add a little more clarity here. I'm going to open up the shadows just a bit more. Okay, then I'm also going to jump down here to the tone curve, and I think I want to try to add a little bit more contrast. I want to try to bring out more of the, um, 
more of these these details here and also in here as well I want to try to get some more contrast out of that I want a little bit more drama out of the image so again I'm going to just change to a medium contrast curve and again that gradation that I spoke about before I see it a lot better now now one thing that I notice when I do that and this is something I haven't talked about too much um, is temperature in the last image the white balance was pretty good I, I was pretty happy with the white balance with the the uh, balance between cool and warm but in this case I feel as though the image has gotten a little bit too cool now as I've added contrast and color and vibrance it saturated the image some more and now the white balance to my liking to, to sort of my subjective eye is a little too cool so I'm going to come back up here and I'm going to adjust the temperature to give me more of a sense of warm light all right that's a lot better there Okay, so I didn't have to back off in the saturation. I basically changed the temperature slider. Notice that by doing that, I've taken out some of that deep blue that was in the foreground, um, and I've added more warmness to the uh, light area in the top of that mountain. So let me show you that again, because I think that's really critically uh, critical to understand. Here's the original white balance as shot. Because it's cool, it's adding a lot more cooler tones to the image which I cooler hues to the image which I don't want but I don't want to desaturate it I want to change the quality of the light really change it to what I saw it was this again it was this sort of this um, nice uh, tension between cool and warm right now the whole image feels too cool I don't have enough warm to create this tension this movement from bottom to top that I'm talking about so I'm going to warm it up and around there 63 and change is really what I'm looking for okay so that's before and that's after okay now I'm going to jump into the uh, adjustment so what I want to do here first I want to I think I want to control the sky a little more I, I need to darken the sky just a bit to give me a little bit more interest in the sky I also want to I want to maybe emphasize some of these clouds that are being reflected in the foreground which you don't see in the sky because I've framed it very low and maybe open up some of the shadows here in these rocks so I'm going to switch to a brush and for the sky because we've got a very very clear edge here instead of using a graduated filter I'm just going to use a brush and I'm going to turn auto mask on and a lot of times when I do this I will uh, drop the exposure a lot just so that I, just so that I see uh, what what I'm doing so I can see the effect and as long as my little plus the plus symbol in the brush as long as it doesn't cross over or touch the mountain then the mask the auto mask will be confined to the sky area and for that I'm going to um, just pull down a little bit on the highlights add a little bit of clarity All right, and you can start to see slight amounts of clouds and edges back here. I'm going to add a little more clarity. Okay, and that's pretty much all I want to do. Just to make the sky, um, just to give it some dimension, but not enough to interfere with everything that's happening below it. I'm going to create a new brush. I'm going to turn off auto mask now because I want to do this more freehand. Um, I'm going to... I also think I want to brighten up the... Uh, foreground a bit so I'm going to switch over to the graduated filter for a moment I'm going to pull up a filter like so and I'm just going to open up the shadows a little bit on this there we go so I'm looking to I'm looking to give me a little bit more uh, light a, a little bit more tonal variation down here just a little bit that's all I'm looking to do now I'm going to come back to this brush up here and I'm going to pull this down just a little bit more maybe less in the highlights and more in the clarity 
All right, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna call up call up a new brush. I'm gonna make this a lighten brush, which means a dodge brush or lighten. It means it's brightening whatever I brush with. I'm gonna turn off the auto mask as I said before. That's off, and I'm gonna just brighten this little cloud here in the foreground. Okay. And I'm going to redo that again. I'm not quite, I don't like what I did there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce the flow down to about 60. That'll give me a little bit more subtle ap application of this brush so that it's not so harsh. And this means that I'm dropping the opacity in the brush. And every time I brush in, every time I apply it, it's applying it by that same opacity amount. There we go. That looks a lot, a lot more natural. All right. And then I'm going to create a new brush. Same thing, that'll be a uh, lighten brush. By the way, let me go back to this one again. The other thing I think I wanna do here is add some clarity as well. There we go, because when you add clarity, especially to clouds, that just gives them some more uh, dimension and depth. And then I'm going to go back to that final brush or create a new one. And I'm going to hit or apply it to some of these areas here. All on this rock and here. And there, and also I'm going to drop the flow again, and just along this area here to kind of highlight that reflection there. And that's 0.25 exposure, and I'm going to add some clarity to that mask as well. I'm going to put the flow up at 100 and just reapply it here as well, just to get it full strength. All right, there we go. So let's look at before, and yeah, let's look at after. All right, and that's looking pretty good. Now, I didn't cover uh, sharpening too much in the previous image. I wanted to talk about it more here. Again, I'm trying to manage time as best as possible and just give you a sense of how I approach uh, the editing process. Um, if I jump down to detail here, I'm going to apply some sharpening my radius is going to be, oh, 1.1, 1 1.2. I've got some texture, but not a whole lot. I mostly have very coarse uh, edges, and so you want to use a low radius when you have lots of edges, a higher radius when you don't have so many. And masking is the key thing here. While in the other image, I kind of wanted to sharpen everything except for the sky. Here, I can use masking to mask off large parts of the image, which are relatively soft, which don't need sharpening, like all of the water in the sky. And that, A, preserves those areas from being over-sharpened or being sharpened at all. Number two, it eliminates any possibility of sharpening noise. And most importantly, when you apply sharpening like this, it allows the image to breathe more because only areas that get the sharpening uh, will come forward. The areas that are sharper tend to attract our attention, tend to come forward, and other areas tend to recede. So I hold down the Option key click on the masking adjustment, and as I push it up, you can see those areas turning black, which are not going to get any sharpening, and the areas that are white will get sharpening. And this will give you a much better sense of depth, especially if you print your images. Okay, I'll add a little bit of noise reduction just to take out any inherent noise, but I doubt I have many much here. As I mentioned before, using a uh, mirrorless camera, at least my Olympus, I don't need to check the profile uh, correction because that's done in camera. All right, so that's my, I think that's my finished image. Here's before and here's after. Once again, I printed this on um, In Lightroom, the only adjustment I made here was that in page setup, I can uh, changed it to a horizontal or a vertical orientation, and I changed my my identity plate here, my logo, again to a different orientation and placed it there. All right, so let's jump back into uh, Keynote and look at the the print. So 
So here's the uh, the finished print, and once again, I chose uh, Can't Sound Infinity Printmaking Rag. Uh, I promise in the next webinar I will choose uh, images that I print on different papers. <laughs> but in this case, I felt that this paper, again, really gives me a, a feel for the image. The, the, the very, very beautiful texture of the paper just adds enough depth and dimension to the image, but it doesn't interfere with this beautiful, smooth uh, uh, water at all. In fact, the water is very smooth, but it's not glass smooth. It's got subtle, slight movements to it. You can see, if you look carefully in the foreground, that the water itself just has a little bit of movement. It's not perfectly, perfectly smooth. You can especially see it in the reflection of the mountain in the back. And so because it has some movement, if it, you know, then this paper, I think, complements it well. Uh, once again, I don't lose any sharpness at all because of a matte paper. You can see here in the foreground uh, of the print itself, those grasses are tack sharp, but yet they feel organic. They feel textured and smooth. They don't feel like they are being, uh, they're pushed too, too forward in the image, which would happen, I think, if I had used uh, some sort of fiber or luster paper. Here's what I was talking about before in terms of the water having some movement to it, especially as you get closer to the further edge, you can see how the wind is actually disturbing the water. Um, the rocks also have a very nice grainy feel to them on the paper, which is what I want. I want, again, that sense of, uh, of a very organic look. That's just, again, my approach. And here's, uh, once again, this is 13 by 19. Uh, size print, I leave about an inch all around the image, uh, at least on the sides, and then top and bottom, uh, whatever the you know the, whatever the aspect ratio is. I don't crop the images; I print them as um, as I as I as I made them. I never conform the image to a piece of paper. I always conf I always print the you know whatever my my image is, and then the paper I cut it off. I would never want to compromise my composition, which is so important, because of paper size and so sometimes I do have to make adjustments especially with a camera like the Olympus which is uh, micro four thirds and so the aspect ratio is a little squarer than you would get uh, with a DSLR you can see here uh, there's a lot of room top and bottom um, because this is a 13 by 19 sheet of paper all right so uh, I hope that's been uh, interesting and useful I'm more than happy to um, ask you uh, to answer questions for a little while. Uh, let's see here, you bear with me because uh, I have lots of questions here, so I'm going to try to uh, scroll through these and see if there are any that I think uh, I can address and answer many questions at the same time. Um, do you normally use filters and degrad in the shoot or in develop? Um, well, as I showed you, I do use graduated filters in Lightroom. Um, I occasionally use filters in the field. The only filters that I regularly will use are um, graduated ND filters and ND filters. ND filters block all light, and so that's good for long exposures, for example. And graduated filters I use if I need to control uh, a, a part of the image meaning it's too bright, I need to darken it, you know, I need to make it darker. Um, but I don't use circular polarizers all that much. I used to, uh, but I don't anymore because I find that the, their limitations um, are, too, are too great for what I'm trying to do. So by that I mean, A, um, it's much easier for me to darken the luminance channel in Lightroom, the blue luminance channel, to darken my sky, and I don't have to worry about how much uh, versus a circular polarizer you know, once you once you take a picture with the polarizer on, you can't depolarize. You also have a problem if you shoot wide-angle lenses where anything wider than 20 millimeters, you get that uh, sort of uneven sky. Uh, the only time I use circular polarizers now regularly is for cutting down glare, uh, leaves and rocks, uh, especially in the fall, or if I'm trying to see into water to uh, remove a reflection and see into the water. But otherwise, I try to capture it all in camera. As far as graduated filters, again, if my if I make an image and my histogram isn't clipping the highlights or the shadows, I don't need to use a filter in the field. As long as I'm capturing all the tones in camera, I've got it all. It's only when uh, I exceed the ability of my sensor to capture the tones that I then either have to use a filter or do some kind of, uh, of a bracketing. 
What is your default calibration in Lightroom? That's an excellent question, which I did not get into uh, once again because of time constraints. I will say that um, I don't have a default one. I switch between them depending on the look that I'm looking for. So on my Canon cameras, um, I typically like to use camera natural or neutral, I think it's called. Um, I think it's neutral. Sometimes I will use camera standard. On my Olympus, I have never been happy with any of the profiles that Lightroom supplies. And so I use profiles by a third party called Hue Light, H-U-E-L-I-G-H-T. Uh, and you can actually download or you can buy camera profiles from Hue Light uh, for Lightroom. And that's the one that I used for this image. So you can look that up online and, and uh, check that out for yourself. Do you shoot, uh, should you use auto white balance or do you adjust the scene at the time of capture? Well, if I'm shooting in raw, uh, white balance is not an issue or uh, a variable because uh, if you shoot in raw, you can always adjust the white balance afterwards. So I'm not committed to any white balance in the field. And afterwards, as I showed you, white balance for me is going to be a very subjective decision based on um, the kind of mood and atmosphere that I'm trying to create or that I feel the image is going to, uh, it, it, you know, that's, it's going to make the image, complement the image as best as possible. So uh, that's, a, that's a subjective decision. But again, in RAW, I don't ha I'm not, you're not committed to having to make a decision at any point. Um, are you focusing manually, Robert, or putting a focal point on top of that rock? Well, this is going to be uh, based on memory. I'm trying to remember what I did. Sometimes I will use the autofocus if it's really dark and I don't trust my eyes, uh, especially my Canon where I'm using the optical viewfinder. If it's dark, I might just use uh, the, fo the focus point. I always use the center focus point for this very reason because I don't have to worry about the, the camera choosing a focus point. So I have my cameras, all my cameras set to the center focus point. And B, I always use some a vari variation of back button focusing. So either on my Canon, I'm using the back button to focus. On my Olympus, I have a little lever that I can switch between manual and autofocus. So once I get that focus set, I turn the focus off. Or in case of the Canon, I'm using back button focusing. Once I get the focus set, I don't touch that back button anymore. And now when I press the shutter button, I'm just exposing. I'm not changing uh, focus. Do you use a light meter? Uh, no, I do not. I use, um, how do I approach exposure? Well, I use the camera's exposure meter as a guide. And then I use the only tool that will actually tell you the tones that you're capturing or not. And that is the histogram. When I look at the back of my camera after every single exposure, I look at the histogram and I determine if I have captured all the tones and if I haven't, how I have to change my exposure. I do not, I repeat, I do not use the LCD preview to judge exposure because that is a sure way to be completely um, confused about the proper exposure. The only thing that will accurately tell you if you've captured all the tones is the histogram. If you're not, if you're not using the histogram, it's basically like, you know, driving your car without a steering wheel. You're not really, you don't really know if this computer that you're using is recording the data that you're pointing it at, okay? Um, uh, is there a way to get a set of paper swatches printed? So I have a feeling of what the print looks like on which paper. Um, Canson does offer um, what we call sample packs, which is uh, eight or 10 sheets of paper in a pack that you can print yourself. They also offer swatches, which is basically all of Canson's papers available as a swatch. And you can feel what the papers are, but you, I don't think that they make uh, a, a as it were, something with images printed on it. Part of the reason for that is because, as I said before, and I've said in other, uh, I've written extensively on my blog and in my book and on the webinars that I've done for Canson Infinity, um, I don't use a paper-centric approach. I use an image-centric approach, which means I don't select the paper and then print everything on that paper. I evaluate each image, and then I, I am familiar with a few papers that almost always... I know I'm going to work with the types of images that I make. That might be different for you, that everyone has their different approach and what and the different things that they want to express. But I match up the paper to the image based on what I want to say with the image and what the paper's strengths and characteristics are. Okay. 
Um, interested to how you decide border size versus print size. As I said before, um, the border is basically, uh, well, I, I, in general, I leave about an inch and a half all around the paper. Um, it looks good, sure, but also it gives me a place to handle it. It gives me a place to put my hand so that I don't get oils on the print itself. More importantly, if I decide to mat the print, mat and frame the print, then I have borders to put behind the mat. If I print to the edge or do a full bleed, I don't have that option. I only do a full bleed when I'm making a very special presentation or a special, uh, a special print that is going to be uh, borderless. Uh, when preparing your image for printing, do you adjust the brightness to compensate for the printing or do you rely entirely on monitor calibration? Excellent question, and it's a question that I um, talk about extensively in, my, in all my printing workshops. Uh, but the short answer to your question is I do not adjust the brightness. I do not add the uh, brightness adjustment in Lightroom uh, because all of my prints match my monitor when it comes to brightness levels. Now, I'll tell you two reasons why I think that is based on experience and talking to lots of people. Number one, cal proper calibration is important. Not only calibrating your monitor, but making sure that your ambient light levels in your in wherever your computer is uh, are appropriate. That's number one. And number two, my experience is that um, most people's monitors are too bright. If your monitor brightness is too high, you're going to be less willing to increase the brightness on your print. You print it out, and guess what? It's too dark. So my, uh, you know, my main uh, tip or hint is lower the brightness of your monitor. As an example, I'm using an iMac 27-inch uh, Retina computer with its display and the brightness settings on an iMac go from 0 to 10. You know, as you hit the brightness button on the keyboard, you have like 10 increments. I do all of my work at the, at, at the brightness level at 40%. Everything at 40%. If I do it at 100%, it's too bright. I get eye fatigue and I start backing off on the adjustments. I tend to make the prints a little bit darker than they need to be. And paper is a completely different medium. It will never match the output level of these new uh, LCD LEDs. And so you need to readjust your monitor so that it's a little closer to what your paper is. I'm not compromising my ability to see colors or hues or tones. It's just a question of recalibrating your eye and adjusting your monitor properly. And um, I don't have any problems. And the students that take my workshops, uh, I, they see that here as well. And um, I think they can see that it is possible to match your prints to your monitor to a fair degree. I don't want this to get into a printing workshop, but uh, just say the goal here is not to match my monitor. The goal is to make a print that looks as best that looks as best as possible. That's the goal. Now, the closer my monitor is, the better I can make judgments. But if it looks great in my hand and I've made that print based on what I saw on my monitor, then uh, I'm, I'm good to go. Um, Do you ever use exposure blending? Yes, I do use exposure blending uh, uh, depending on what I'm trying to uh, achieve and what the conditions provide. Um, a lot of, you know, exposure blending in general, I think uh, for me personally, has to do more with my approach to photography, what I'm trying to accomplish. I'm the, my whole point of doing this is to enjoy the creative process. I enjoy challenging myself in the field. I enjoy trying to work with light and conditions. And so I'm much more willing, if you will, to go to a place over and over and over again versus trying to um, force an image that isn't quite there by capturing three or four exposures. Now, that's just my personal approach. Um, if the light's too strong, I would actually rather go back. It, it, I, I'd rather be out in the field than behind my computer. That's not a pronouncement or judgment on other people who enjoy more of the techniques of the software. I just like being around trees and being in beautiful landscapes. And uh, I think the better I make, the better I can see, the more I improve my ability to see in nature. Probably that leads to better photographs. I hope. Um, a few more here before we sign off. Um, what are your thoughts on re purchasing refurbished printing equipment? <laughs> um, 
Well, that'll be my last question that I'll answer. Uh, it depends on the manufacturer and um, how comfortable you are with them and uh, whether it has a warranty, et cetera. You know, I've bought, I've bought many um, refurbished items from, from Apple, never had a problem. I've bought new products from other companies and had problems. So that's kind of hard uh, to, uh, you know, to, to answer carefully. I just think use your judgment um, and, uh, you know, use your, use your judgment and, uh, and go with what you think uh, is, is, uh, is the best way to go. Alrighty, so I'm going to finish up. Um, I'm going to finish up with a quote. The mind is a tool. It is either clogged, bound, rusty, or it is a clear way to and from the soul. An artist should not be afraid of his tools. He should not be afraid to know. And this is from the great painter and artist and teacher, Robert Henry, who I love and have studied for a long time. Uh, and uh, it's kind of, again, the way I approach making images. So don't let your camera... You know, that is to say, don't let your camera or the software technique get ahead of striving for personal vision. Go beyond the location, go beyond the subject matter, and give the viewer, give your viewers something to think about, not just something to see. All right, so that wraps up this webinar. I hope it was informative and helpful. Thanks again for watching and for supporting me in what I love to do, which is sharing the value of living a creative life. Uh, watch for more webinars in the near future. Goodbye.